One, two, whoa. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Christy. I am the executive director of the United Nations Association of Albania, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome you in this event that promises to be intellectually stimulating, but also for us it's really important because it marks a kickoff of one of our most exciting new projects, implementation of the Art Nexus program in Albania. So the Art Nexus program is run by the Swedish Arts and Grants Committee with funding from the Swedish Development and Cooperation Agency, SIDA, and it's being piloted in two different countries, Albania and Armenia. So similar names, different context. And in both countries, uh, it's a program that seeks to promote artistic freedom, and it combines development intervention and policies with the field and sector of arts and culture, which is really interesting. And it's one of the um, very first kind of project of this kind, and surely the first one in, in Albania. And uh, here in Albania, the activities that are being organized in the framework of the Art Nexus program are being implemented and designed by the United Nations Association of Albania and another implementing partner. So um, what you can expect from us in this framework of this wonderful project is a lot of activities that connect this kind of dots. So poli policy intervention and advocacy, um, and the uh, exploration of the interlinkage between arts and culture on one side, and then sustainable development and human rights on the other. So there will be a series of video podcasts uh, that will revolve around the concept of resilience of artists and artist space in Albania. There will be a series of op-eds um, that will uh, uh, further uh, go deeply in exploring different themes be it in different areas, uh, disciplines of the visual arts. Uh, there will be manuals that will help artists um, regarding um, you know, project management, project writing, but also what is really important, intellectual property, how to sell or uh, land your work of art, and also two studies that will, uh, that will uh, explore more different policy interventions in this field, being funding mechanisms in general for the arts and culture sector in Albania, or the element of inclusivity and access to art. Now, uh, the Art Nexus program in Albania will also uh, support the further development of a project that we programmed that we started last September which is called Annex, which is an arts and artistic and educational program within which also this wonderful event falls into. Now, I will pass the floor to my colleague, Donika, who is uh, the, the one that came up with the uh, Annex, is the director of the Annex program, to talk a bit about the program and then make the direct link to the, our guest speaker and our event today. Hello, everybody. Um, Thank you for being here. I'm very excited and also very nervous because this is a very important and uh, beautiful event. Before giving the floor to Christopher, I would uh, like to say a few words about Annex. So uh, Annex is a nomad artistic and educational program. That's why tonight we are at Berk as a ho uh, that hosts us. And uh, Annex is a program that matches intentionally visually impaired people with visual artists in an endeavor to co-create and explore what are the differences, what are the um, constraints, the abilities of each other. As a program, it makes use of dialogues, of workshops, of uh, reading sessions, and of exhibitions in order to rethink about the world, to rethink about uh, the artistic uh, program. So tonight we are very happy to explore uh, together with Christopher Annex core idea of blindness and visual impairment in literature. So we have a very important question tonight, which is, is literature a visual or an oral form of art? Um, 
you had before, before finally giving you the floor, maybe a small presentation of Christopher, even though most of you must know uh, him very well. So Christopher uh, Leandauer is a Swedish poet, essayist, literary critic, novelist and translator. His deb uh, debut in uh, 1987, the poetry selection Diving Bell, has been followed by a varied biography consisting of more than 30 published books, including horror mo stories, fantasy novels, a mayor work in French literature history, The House That Proved Sealed, 200 Years of French Modernism. He's many times awarded for his essays about the nature of literature and the process of reading and writing, and is twice nominated for the prestigious August Prize in 2010. They say mask, literature as hiding place, and in 2020, they say longing home, longing the way, currently being translated into Albanian. His latest book, they say um, unfinished literature, was published in January 2023 and has spanned the spring as a steady feature of literary critics favorite list. One time member of the Nobel Committee, La Landor, currently lives in Tirana. So thank you very much. The floor is yours. We are very eager to hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danica. Uh, thank you for uh, the this year's most interesting question to uh, be a part of this uh, extremely interesting intellectual adventure, uh, art for visually impaired. I um, I th I've actually thought you joked first. But you didn't, and um, so I had to take you seriously. And uh, it's a very good, it's a very good question. And uh, f I feel slightly in awe here at Berk, since it's a very the high uh, high intellectual level here uh, is. Um, awe-inspiring, so I thought I must rise to the occasion and have a theoretical basis for my talk. So I have chosen two. Um, they are not normally associated with literary theory. The first one is Sigmund Freud in a paper from 1908 when he stated that all literature is a form of wish fulfil fulfillment. All literature. Uh, not just fairy tales, but all. Tragedies, horror stories, everything is wish fulfillment in one way or the other. The second source is from the horror movie The Silence of the Lambs, where uh, serial killer uh, Hannibal Lecter states, We covet what we see. Now, covet is an uh, unusual English word meaning desire, so we desire what we can see. So we read and we write what we desire, and we desire what we see. What we see. Because literature is primarily associated with eyesight. We assume that literature is something that takes place on the printed page. Something that makes use of the spatial possibilities that the page offers us. Reading, it is implied, is something we do with our eyes. Therefore, Eyesight is considered the most trustworthy of our senses, the one with highest evidential value in courts, for instance. Something seen is considered more reliable than something overheard, because we read with our eyes, and words are more important to us than the world they describe. Nowadays, this is changing. People read with their ears more than with their eyes today. Audiobooks are taking over more and more of the book market. Oh, I have to stand like this. Um, this is often depicted as a crisis and a threat to the fundamental values of literature. Can you still hear me? Good. Uh, the specific qualities the specific qualities of literature, it said, are lost in translation. What goes in through the ears is a diluted version of the text purged of complications and intricacies. But this reflects a relatively late development in the history of literature. That's a polite way of saying it's not true. 
We don't know for a fact that Homer was blind. In fact, we don't know that Homer was Homer. But the popular legend of the blind, wandering, barred Homer reflects one thing we almost certainly do know. Being blind was no hamper, because the Iliad and the Odyssey was, were not conceived in written form, they were memorized. Much of the verbal finery we, even today, several thousand years later, associate with poetry, alliterations, rhymes, meter, repetitions, standing epithets such as rosy-fingered eels for mourning, they are simply mnemonic tricks, devices to make long poems easier to remember. Being blind would not have been a, a hinder to the poet Homer. When the written page over time became the normal form of distribution for literature, it did not greatly affect how people consumed literature. Wealthy Roman noblemen would have slaves reading aloud to them. Only poor people read themselves, if they could read, which they most normally couldn't. And then they read aloud. Literature was an oral art form. A library would have been a very, very loud place. Um, well into medieval times, silent reading only meant that you mouthed the text instead of speaking it aloud. Still, other senses than eyesight were involved. Reading with your eyes only is a late norm. This goes for writing too. Goethe didn't write his books, he talked them. Dostoevsky dictated his great novels to his second wife, Anna Grigorievna Dostoevska, who entered his life when he was in desperate need of a school stenographer. They fell in love halfway through the novel The Gambler. The complex plot schemes and large galleries of ca characters that constitute the Dostoevsky novel were largely kept in his head. Even Henry James, the most novelly of all novelists, the most artificial and complex of all the great 19th century novelists, dictated his novels. He kept it all in his head. And it all didn't end when Hemingway and company made the typewriter look romantic and arty. John Williams, the novelist of Stoner, Augustus, and Butcher's Crossing, started writing novels during the Second World War when he was stationed in Burma as a wireless operator on a bomb plan plane. During every night flight, Williams composed as much as he could memorize in his head, and then, after the flight, hurried to write it down when he returned to our base. That way he wrote the whole of his first novel. He kept this way of writing the ho his whole life, and uh, you can find that condensed, very, very dense sort of stone style in all of his novels. So from Homer to Williams, there's a cloud of witnesses. Literature doesn't take place on the page. It's not created by the writer on the white page, nor is it recreated by the reader there. The white page is at best a metaphor, an intermediary, a middleman. Why then do writers need eyesight? That question is easier approached if we turn it upside down. What happens to writing when eyesight is gone or severely impaired? Now, badam, first picture. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Homer apart, the three most famous blind writers are probably 7th century Puritan poet John Milton, author of Paradise Lost. See him there? James Joyce and Jorge Luis Borges. I will return to Milton in a moment, but one similarity between these three is immediately obvious. They are creators of whole worlds. Worlds that aim for completion. Nothing less than a complete portrait of humankind and the universe is what Paradise Lost, Ulysses, Finnegan's Wake, and the Aleph offer their readers. 
even if these worlds, in the case of Borges, are microscopic and virtual, bigger on the inside than on the outside. I would also like to stress the increasingly oral quality of Joyce's work. The huge difference between Finnegan's Wake on the written page, where it is a difficult work, and read aloud when it is funny and immediate. When I started looking for writers that were completely or largely blind, I was astonished to find two names more known for their visual art. One is the British vorticist and painter Wyndham Lewis, and the other, now I have to uh, have the stage show brought on again. That one. And the other is the New Yorker cartoonist James Thurber. Uh, I don't like this cartoon very much. It's sexist in an old fashioned way, but it. Well, I don't like it anyway. Uh, <laughs> but it also hints at the possibilities you gain when the contact with the factual world loosens up. You begin making things up. Not surprising, Thurber's most famous work is a novel about a daydreamer compensating for his humdrum life, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. It would seem that the visionary gift comes with the loss of eyesight. Because the greatest of all modern horror story writers, the American Shirley Jackson, whose novel The Haunting of Hill House, every time you rank best horror stories, best horror novels, wins first place, and it's been called the scariest novel ever written. Uh, she owed something to the literary gift, to the fact that she was severely visually impaired. She could not drive a car, and she never even left her house in later years. From early childhood, Jackson was regularly haunted by visual hallucinations. She, she was seeing faces in the lawn, oft, often an old bearded man, and she was highly surprised when she found out that others didn't see what she saw. This helped, of course, shaping her singular and scary world view, populated by witches and unknown otherworldly entities, but also deepened her sense of uh, isolation and being singular. Same thing about the British fantasy writer Charles Williams, who was a good friend of Tolkien and Lewis, and member of the informal storytelling club, The Inklings where a large part of uh, the 20th century fantasy world was created. His, his story is astonishingly similar to Jackson's. They were both also chain smokers and huge readers, but, but they were mo first and foremost almost blind. Uh, Williams was his eyesight was so poor, poor that he had to guess his way as soon as he didn't look into a book. He was completely loosed, lost. Uh, and he saw this as a form of everyday magic. He saw it as a continuous and wonderful metamorphosis of the world, where anything could happen at any moment and nothing was given. He says like this, a picture could suddenly begin to walk. A tree could begin to talk. An animal maybe wasn't an animal at all. A human being, maybe not a human being. Because, so he lived in a state of constant surprise and astonishment. We know this world. We, it's called Narnia, Middle Earth, Wonderland. So you lose this world, you gain others. We live in this world ruled by the same natural laws, but that doesn't mean that the world appears the same to each and every one of us. On the contrary, our senses interpret the world. Our senses translate it into something that we make sense of. No two people see the exact same colors. No two people hear the same registers. And our senses are formed by memory. That means individual. We covet what we see. In 1967, there was published an extraordinary book on wildlife called The Peregrine, which is uh, 
uh, a bird or prey. Uh, it was written by amateur ornithologist J. A. Baker, a loner whose day job was with the British Automobile Association. The Peregrine is the most thrilling book ever written about bird watching. Peregrine falcons, hunters of the flat fenlands of coastal eastern England, are the most gracious and ferocious living creatures. And Baker decided to follow them from autumn to spring to record their daily life. Now, he was a man on a bicycle, and these were the fastest and highest flying birds of prey, covering huge areas of land, often visible only as mere specks in the sky. In order to fulfill his task, Baker had to learn to think like a peregrine, feel like a peregrine, act like a peregrine. He had to get into the mind of the hunter, become a hunter himself. Listen to this. Wherever he goes this winter, I will follow him. I will share the fear, the exaltation, and the boredom of the hunting life. I will follow him till my predatory human shape no longer darkens in terror the shaken kaleidoscope of color that stains the deep fovea of his brilliant eye. My pagan head shall sink into the winterland and there be purified. This is in part what makes the peregrine a masterwork. It's more psychodrama than bird watching. Now, did you notice the anatomical details of Baker's description of the bird eye, bird's eye? The shaking kaleidoscope of color that stains the deep phobia of his brilliant eye. I had to look up the word fovea. It's a small cavity in the retina of the eye where eyesight is sharpest. It's the only area in the eye where 2020 vision is possible, the area where colors are clearest and details are finest. Now, how come how this man, working for the Automobile Association, knew so much about the eye? Sometimes after I first read The Peregrine and wanted to find out more about this writer, I was astonished to discover that he was practically blind which saved him from military service during the Second World War. In spite of working at the Automobile Association, he could never get a driver's license. His eyesight was way too poor. Now imagine this guy on a bicycle probing the skies, equipped with not only with binoculars, but with ultra-thick glasses, hunting for an infinitely small and infinitely fast-moving speck in the celestial endlessness. Of course he... Does it work? Do you hear me? Like this, like that? Do you hear me now? Yes. Any, everyone hear me? Yes. So, uh, Try this one. Okay. So, uh, I'm more Others are too abstract for me, but okay. So, do you hear me now? Good. Further, yeah, like this. Okay. What? <laughs> Defy normally. Okay. Of course, he, better than most people, could see the world from the viewpoint of an alien life form. He had practically no vision of his own that could stand in the way. He was free to identify with a peregrine falcon, free to imagine himself in that state of freedom, perfect vision and sovereignty. Ruler of sky, terror of the earth, DFA, death from above. Now, the situation of G. A. Baker, near blind ornithologist, reminded me of something. And now, it's time for the, this art show here. That's the one. What did it remind him of, me of? 25 years before the Peregrine, 1942, in the middle of World War II, acclaimed British novelist, and I'm not standing in way of him, 
Uh, today, almost exclusively associated with the dystopian novel Brave New World, who had struggled with his poor next to non existent eyesight most of his adult life, published a pamphlet called The Art of Seeing, where he supported the much debated and highly or unorthodox Bates method, claiming that poor eyesight was nothing but a bad habit. Sheer laziness, even and could be cured by a program of visual, visual and this is uh, a word I think will ring familiar to you Albanians, re-education. <laughs> yeah. People were simply not used to making efforts anymore, to consecrate their time, effort, and consideration into changing themselves, Huxley claimed. Anyone having read Brave New World will recognize the underlying thought pattern in the Huxley dystopia, people are letting themselves be ruled by indulging th themselves and giving up to their baser instincts. Resistance to oppression begins with res resistance to the self, Huxley claims. The art of seeing is filled with exercises for the eye. Sunglasses are bummed, and one useful exercise for <laughs> improving your eyesight, this is true, is looking straight into the sun. Very helpful. Uh, Huxley <laughs> claimed having cured himself this way. Well, we shall see about that. Uh, it's when you stop trying to see that eyesight returns, according to Huxley. For him, the ego, the self, stands in the way of 2020 vision. Huxley's exercise in the art of seeing, of looking into the sun, are similar to the prying eyes of the almost blind baker searching the sky for the tiny, tiny dot of the peregrine falcon to reappear. Soon, sooner or later, of course, if you stared long enough into the sun, the peregrine falcon would appear. Here I would like to refer you back to the theory of Sigmund Freud, literature as a form of wish fulfillment. Literature is as it's very least a way of constructing a world that we care to live in. But Huxley's obsession with eyesight was far from over. When he chooses the title Eyeless, Eyeless in Gaza for his 1936 novel, portraying an intellectual and spiritual voyage from public school bullying to pacifism, it's indirect proof that he saw a link between his lifelong struggles with eyesight and he struggles to become not only a precursor, but a visionary. Someone who envisions what could be. Later, in his 1954 pamphlet discussing the mind-altering drug mescaline, The Doors of Perception, Huxley would emphasize the drug's visual effects. He says, visual impressions are greatly intensified and the eye recovers some of the perceptual innocence of childhood when the sensum was not immediately and automatically subordinated to the concept. The 4th May 1943, Hollywood Hills, taking during Aldous Huxley's first experience of masculine, what do we see? Do we see a prophet overlooking the promised land? or a nearly blind man probing into nothingness. Is this someone who sees more, or someone who sees less? It's both, actually. Uh, so we saw Huxley moving eyesight problems from the medical department to the philosophical. It became for him a moral issue. This is what British writer Jean Rees, who had no particular problems with her eyesight, wrote in one of her notebooks. With this eye I see, and no other. I cannot see with other people's eyes. With my own eyes I must see. When I let go of what I have seen, I'm lost in a world so black and deadly, I'm crazy with fear. So she in identifies blindness not with the loss of eyesight, but with the loss of personal truth. A world so black is not a visual, it's a moral phenomenon a state of inauthenticity, of bad faith. And with that last world, faith, we have reached our last great blind writer, John Milton, 
the former revolutionary and king uh, beheader, uh, who became completely blind at the age of 43 in the year of 1652. I now will have to ask someone to change back from this guy to the other guy. Uh, 20 years later, 1679, he publishes the verse drama Samson Agonistas. Yeah, that's the one. Um, dictated to his two daughters, uh, a process that probably wasn't that idyllic, that's this much later print from the 19th century, I think, will have it. Milton's daughter are say said to have suffered greatly under their father's tyranny, wishing for his, old for his death, and even according to some legends, hurrying it on. Um, and this is what he writes. Ask for this great deliverer now and find him eyeless in Gaza at the mill with slaves. It's Samson Agonistus pro provides us with the most poignant elegy of lost eyesight ever written. O oh dark, 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 amid the blaze of noon, irrecoverably dark, total eclipse without all hope of day, O first created being, and thou great word, let there be light, and light was over all. Why am I thus bereaved, thy prime decree? The sun to me is dark, and silent as the moon, when she deserts the night, hid in a vacant interlunar cave. Milton goes on making the highly original wish that sight was not confined. What? Yeah? Yes, okay. Okay, yeah, I can. Um, that sight wasn't confined to the eyes, but spread all over the body, and therefore less sensitive and harder to damage. Every pore in the skin, an eye, in short, he wished that humans were like octopuses. We much must not take him too seriously, because even this short quotation shows that he found rich compensations for his eyesight. Even in this unspeakably moving elegy of lost sight, Milton changes to oral imagery, silent as the moon. Samson, from the Bible. Um, his situation is analog to Milton's own. His unique quality, his great strength, he had wrestled with lions and struck down whole enemy armies, is unimpaired and ready to serve freedom or God, but his blindness makes it useless. Or so he thinks in his moment of despair, but despair is a deadly sin. And Samson is able to bring down the temple and smite his enemies. His strength is not useless, the moment he realizes that he is with inward eyes illuminated, Milton says, with inward eyes illuminated. This is more in line with his original reaction when he w discovered that he was losing his sight, as it ap appears in this sonnet written in the year of his blindness, 1652. When I consider how my life is spent, here half my days, in this dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide, lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent, to serve therewith my maker and present, my true account, lest he returning chide, doth God's exact day labor, light denied? I fondly ask, but patience to prevent, that murmur soon replies, God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts, who best bear his mild yoke. They serve him best. His state is kingly. Thousand as his bidding speed and post o'er land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. So blind and not, not, Milton says, he can still do God's bidding because God doesn't really need our particular skill set, those things that we are proud of. What he really wants from us is our capability to bear his mild yoke. In other words, 
carry our burden without complaints. They also serve who only stand and wait. That's a remarkable line. If we con consider the year when it was written, 1652, it was hardly a year that emphasized the Buddha nature of man, the capacity to refrain from action. 1652, the same year, Britain starts a war with the Netherlands to become the dominating sea power. They had just gone through civil war. They had just killed their king. And next year, Oliver Cromwell would pro proclaim himself Lord Protector and uh, introducing dictatorship in England. For an old revolutionary such as John Milton, standing and waiting was a radical thing to do. But something in tune with the poetical movement of that day, a movement that didn't recognize itself as such, but got its brand name some hundred years later as metaphysical poetry. It's for a modern reader, it's easy to identify because it's indifferent to the outer world and concentrating on inner truth, inner vision. The metaphysical poets played with differences between appearance and reality, lights and shadows. They treated abstractions as real phenomena and phenomena as persons. Few went further than Thomas Traherne, who liked to imagine what the world would look like if you had no senses at all, none. What would you see if you had no sight, hear if you had no ears, etc.? In a poem called The Preparatory, Traherne speaks of dying before finding out the proper use of his sensatory organs, such as those living stars, my eyes. Then was my soul, my only all to me, a living endless eye, far wider than the sky whose power, whose act, whose essence was to see. I was an inward sphere of light or an interminable orb of sight. So he goes on on telling how he forgot the other senses, sound, touch, smell, taste, and was all sight, all eye. The conclusion is that the true essence of metaphysical poetry and the essence of what I wanted to share with you in this talk of sight versus vision. It is not the object but the light that maketh heaven. It is a poor, purer sight. Felicity appears to none but them that truly see. This was also the conclusion, of course, of the greatest metaphysical poet of them all, the complicated Dean John Donne whose life and poetry held room for both witticism and despair, eroticism and sermons. He also made the point of separating eyesight from inner vision. Churches are best for prayer that have least light. To see God only, I go out of sight. To see, I go out of sight. This would be a good place to end, but I don't want to think you to think that I'm on purpose avoiding the greatest poet of them all. William Shakespeare, just because he doesn't fit in with my scheme. <coughs> he does. I've been saving him for last. If John Don didn't need visual impairment to concentrate us on his inner vision, William Shakespeare doesn't need darkness at all. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, Theseus, Duke of Athens, claims that vision is interior. Created in the mind, the madman sees devils, the lover sees the beauty of Helen, then Theseus turns the dogma of Hannibal Lecter upside down. He doesn't claim that we covet what we see, but the exact opposite of that. We see what we covet. The poet's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth, the forms of things are known. The poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. The poet's eye is rolling from heaven to earth and back again. Nothing hints that the poet's vision is impaired, but that doesn't matter at all. The inside is bigger than the outside. The poet scans heaven and earth only to dismiss everything there in favor of things unknown. Things from her 
own imagination things she doesn't need her eyes to see. So, what have we found? Is literature, literature a visual or an oral form of art? The answer appears to be neither and both. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. Um, are we open to a few questions? Yeah, if you would so. like yeah. to... I hope so. Yes. Actually, can I change my mind if the questions are too difficult? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Good. So, uh, would you like to do any question to Christopher or us? I, I was glad you brought up Shakespeare at the end because I was going to ask you, uh, do you think it's odd that we read plays in school? You know, we read Shakespeare and Strindberg and things like that, which are basically scripts, you know, so. I mean, you read them uh, as text? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I don't think it's, I mean, uh, that's what we do in school, or used to do, at least, uh, read it. It's the, I mean, uh, despite me having done this talk, I mean, uh, when you go out from here, uh, the eye is still the, the queen of the senses as far as society is concerned. So uh, there will still be a lot of reading, and that will be the number way, one number one way of transforming knowledge. Uh, so that will no, that will not change. Even though, I mean, I, I do agree that. Uh, a play is a thing for all senses, not only for, for the eye. It should be, anyway. Um, but schools are very, very conservative institutions. So... Um, I would like to make a short commentary and to offer an not an alternative perspective, but more to displace a bit the uh, the the point of view about this question of uh, visuality. Uh, there was. Um, as far as I could uh, understand, uh, there was a type of a scheme, a pattern in your uh, discourse. There was this type of dialectic between the, um, the metaphysical gift of the poet, uh, the one who can see what uh, empirically uh, cannot be seen, uh, the one that somehow has this type of channel, uh, is like uh, to, towards this um, dimension this uh, transcendence, and uh, uh, the poet is uh, like classically, and uh, not only in the classical age, but in every type of age, is like this prophet of the abstract. And on the other hand, we have the uh, the the, quoti uh, the 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 everyday, yeah, the everyday experience of uh, missing uh, much of what has to be seen uh, in every dimension like political, artistic, sentimental, and uh, metaphysical, scientific, and so on. I just wanted to uh, explore this other point of view. Uh, in uh, contemporary uh, literature, uh, there is this, uh, and philosophy especially, uh, um, especially this type of current that is called the, the speculative realism, they have really made a type of archaeology of uh, a very important event, which is the death of the transcendental. Uh, you spoke about a vision and the impaired vision, which means when we have an impaired vision, we have to talk about a sort of transversal communication between the senses. Like you type of awaken when you, you go blind, you, you must awaken the other senses. And these uh, resonances between the other senses make up uh, about this lack of sight let's say, and they produce another, uh, another type of vision, which is very rich, very stimulating. But the idea, what I'm talking about, is like 
we don't just have the blindness. We don't just have the death of the sight. But we have the death of the death of the sight. What I mean is that with the death of the transcendental, we have the death of the sensorium body. Uh, and this type of death, what I'm talking about, is very much uh, um, uh, talked about, written about, like, let's say by uh, Jean-François Lyotard, many uh, Gilles Deleuze, many of the French uh, philosophical uh, guys that have written extensively about these type of things. And they offer some types of truth. They say that the contemporary condition in which we live, we feel, we think, uh, is the loss, the total loss of uh, ontological coordinates, let's say, uh, because of the death of the sun. Science says that the sun will eventually die. So the problem is not that just we have a, a blind type, a blind character, a blind person. The problem is that every uh, the world will go blind. So uh, uh, if the sun eventually dies after m billions of years, doesn't matter. Let's take it as it is a speculation. It is uh, verified on based on many, let's say, verifications, experiments, etc. It doesn't matter. Let's just take it that it's true for a moment. What can literature, how can literature, the literary dispositive, help us navigate this kind of existential trauma? Uh, because I, uh, I'm really curious about this. Because uh, as long as we are in this dialectic about, you know, um, a sight, non-sight, uh, visually impaired, visually able, you know, uh, this type of dialectical schemes, we can uh, conceptually feel comfortable and guarantee ourselves the going on of the things, the processuality of things. But when the, the, mer the, the transcendental, the condition, the, the Kantian transcendental, the formal transcendental, you know, the subject, its very existence is put into a, a, a question. I mean, uh, this uh, throws, this is very traumatic. And I think literature can help um, people uh, to create, and this is also a question <laughs> for you, of course, but I think uh, uh, literature can create a sort of space, an oniric topology to, to, to navigate this uh, traumatic truth, which is the death of the sun, the cosmic death, et cetera, et cetera, what uh, modern cosmology says, let's say. So thank you, and I'm sorry for being so, like, um, encompassing so many elements, but I just wanted to throw a bit of light to this concern. Yeah. Uh, I, th I don't know if there was a question mark hidden there somewhere, but I, I will say that I think you have, uh, you give, uh, uh, wow, a big assignment for literature. We have the dying of the sun here, and we have literature here, and uh, they should weigh the same. That's, that's a that's a wonderful uh, statement of the importance of, of uh, the human f imagination. But I think you're right. I think it does. But um, uh, I uh, I can't see how that excludes transcendental thinking. But that's another thing. I'm maybe okay. Like okay. Yeah, cool. Not just living cool. the the. the let's say the bleak and yeah. nihil unbound, like the nothingness, the total Yeah, nothing. but no, we don't, you, yeah. So it kind of uh, puts pressure into literature, like it's dialectical yeah. way of... Yeah. Yeah. Literature has pressure anyway. There's, there's no need to add to it. Maybe, yeah, that's. So literature is this. But please, say. I was just saying, what is this guarantee? Like, literature doesn't need pressure. I mean, no, no, no. Wow. Did, did, I mean, we all have pressure. We live under pressure anyway. But, uh, yeah, yeah. But um, I, think I think life would be unbearable without uh, the transcendental, the, 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 the vertical dimension. I think we all would die. Uh, from lack of o oxygen if the verticality disappeared, disappeared out of life. I mean, we all stare at the sky. Uh, some of us looking for a peregrine falcon and others looking for God or, well, the, the, p 
perfect society or whatever, but uh, we all do that. So uh, That's very important. It is. Either we, we do it with our sight or not. But uh, So I don't think you can rule that out. But otherwise, I think you are on your way of uh, writing the nest next talk here. I think uh, uh, I, I'm very pleased with, about, uh, with your answer because what you implied about uh, the impossibility of living without the transcendentum is uh, it means that uh, specifically it is an impossibility that is life. Mm. And it is a sort it is a life that serves as a background for thought. Thought, be it artistic, literary, scientific, whatever kind of thought, be it a, a, a personal cognition, a collective cognition, in whatever stage, in whatever registry it is, the background of this image of thought is life. Mm. And in contemporary science, from we sort of more or less have a bit of experience on this, huh? Uh, there is a dissociation, a very radical dissociation between life and cognition. It's like the interests of cognition do not converge at the end of the horizon with the interests of life. And what I suspect is that contemporary literature cannot abandon life as its transcendental, and by doing so, it has created a big, gigantic gap with what science says. And I'm not saying that I'm in the, mm. I'm siding with science, absolutely. I'm ju I just want to depict the situation. I just want to characterize it, to create a landscape of where we are existentially, mm. metaphysically now. Where is the problem? The neurologic point where we have to, to just point at it, to feel and to think something new. And to, to just um, take uh, responsibility for our problems. What is the real deal now? And what is the real emergent mm. thing to be thought? And uh, by doing this, I think that literature, by having life as its condition, I think that uh, literature has a real challenge before itself because uh, things are mm. getting pretty messed up, pretty hybrid, pretty metamorphic. Mm. <laughs> I think you're right. Well, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that you can't unknow something that you have found out to be true. And uh, that's maybe one of the aspects of uh, uh, losing senses that I found to be uh, discovered were liberating for the people who lost them, that uh, they knew less and therefore saw more. And also and, uh, the yeah. Sorry, and, and also the classic state of literature, let's say. It is, uh, if I understand correctly, if it is related so uh, genetically, so deeply with life, it serves as a type of secular eschatology, as a literature. It helps you to live to navigate through, through, through reality by constructing multiple, let's say, quantum superposed realities. So uh, if it's not this, this way of making literature, another way to do it is like taking account of the new uh, sensory modalities that are being experimented. Like I say, intel artificial intelligence uh, s uh, with natural intelligence, um, technology, how is it? Uh, I intermediating how it is mediating the ways we perceive things. And when this cocktail uh, of, of components has been changed, and uh, by cocktail I mean uh, all the components that make up uh, the final result of what we perceive, uh, when they radically change, what is in play is a radical change of human psychism. And what I mean is that uh, also the formula, the, the, the literature's DNA will change, will not eventually be just bleak life, like life, no, varieties, vegetals, animals, etc. But very, uh, it will be a line of that will touch every dimension and will not have its locus, its topos, predilected topos at life, but like cosmic becoming or like I don't know what or, or nothingness. But I mean, literature is really in a state of precarity, maybe. But this is hope because it will. I feel it will radically change. Yeah. Sorry for taking so long, because I'm so sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are, we, are we out of time or no? <laughs> I mean, we, the live streaming is on Facebook. You're not, we're not paying for it, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah? 
Well, um, first of all, con congratulations. Um, uh, repetition. First of all, congratulations, uh, Art Nexus, Donica, and thank you, uh, Christopher, for the talk. You made me think of uh, two people and the subject. Um, the first person is Alexander from Fieri. He uh, he's a blind man. He's on his 70s now, but I got to know him like uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I would sometimes read for him. I've read some books just because I was out loud reading for him, and it was a, a good exercise for understanding by listening to myself and by and to, to learn how to read Albanian, <laughs> actually, uh, voicely. Then um, he would, he was a musician too, and he would describe sounds and music. He would describe them with colors. Now this is something common. The other thing is he would also describe human voices with colors. So uh, he was like somehow defining the character of, of people by taking um, um, a chance from their their voice and the way they w they would direct to to him. So it was like the better the voice, the sweeter the voice, the lighter the color, <laughs> and the <laughs> and the harsher the voice, the, the darker the color. The thing is. Uh, there's a question, what does he know about colors? Because he, he was born blind. Now, uh, he would also claim that he, he was writing poetry. Yeah, he had some good verses or good uh, groups of group sent uh, good sentences. But he would describe the rise of the sun, like that there was a blue sun and the light coming out of the sun was uh, green or something like that, uh, those colors there. And now, I'm, I was looking at this painting here. It's been here since months, but this is the first time that I'm connecting it with one of the poems that Alexander would invent and would remember. The thing is, he had uh, no um, connection with colors the way those who can see have. He knew the names of the colors, but he had no clue of them. Even if he, when he was describing his blindness, I mean, it was not all black. It was something like there was some something that he could see, he could define. Maybe he could uh, define green, uh, green color from, from black, from total black, total darkness, but that was not a conventional way like we do. Um, the second person that you, you reminded me uh, is George Orwell. Now, why? He is not describing colors. But he is, um, through his uh, novel 1984, he is uh, claiming that when the party will uh, be able to shrink the number, the voc vocabulary of the language and the meanings of the language, uh, of the words, we will lose the ability to speak the way we're speaking now and to uh, mean what we mean now with words. Uh, now, this is one of the linguist theories. I don't remember the name of the, the uh, authors and, uh, and so on, but uh, there is a ling linguist linguistic theory that says that if we lose the contact with words and uh, we lose the uh, contact with their meaning, we are going to uh, forget how to think. And there is an oppository uh, theory that says even if we lose the contact with the words and their meanings, our and but we our brain is not damaged, we will find a way and reconstruct that language. Nevertheless, what it takes, if we are still human beings, we'll be able to reconstruct it. So how we come again to uh, to the initial point? What do we mean uh, with object, light, colors, words, uh, visions, uh, imagination? I think. It's a common point between fantastic, between non-real, and between conventional. If we are writing, if we claim that we are doing literature and saying that a blue sun was rising from the horizon uh, and giving us some uh, green light, except from being some surrealistic poetry, it's nonsense, actually. Uh, so there should be a common point between between uh, conventionality and literature in order for it to be literature. It, all these examples of the writers that you mentioned, none of them was born blind. They were all be uh, first in their life, they were able to see, and then they could think of how it was, but uh, after having the second, this second experience, 
and I don't know if it's an opportunity, of being able to have a life with eyesight and then a life without eyesight. So, yes, the answer is both or none. <laughs> Thank you. I think now we can proceed. We can just have a talk together, and also invite you to have a drink and also some some food. And thank you again for uh, being here, and thank you, Christopher, very much for the talk. It's very important for us. <laughs>